We certainly do pray that Jesus will be with us to help us fight the foes that we fight. You know, many of us here in Houston heard that one of our favorite baseball heroes was hit with a pitch. And I don't know about any of you, I've been in a batting cage before when an 85 mile an hour pitch was coming at me. I cannot imagine what a 95 or 96 mile an hour pitch is like, let alone just stand there that close hoping to hit it. And instead it hits him. We may be very tempted to just want to bail out and get out of all situations, have the, the safest life possible, to never get in the batter's box, so to speak. But we have a Savior who is with us, a Savior who promises to love us and strengthen us, and who, by doing so, says, I have a way for you to overcome all the temptations that are going to be there. I have a way for you to make it through all of that. And that's what we're going to dig in and, and take a look at today. As you heard in the gospel reading, this is the story of Jesus going into the wilderness and, and going without food for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm grateful that's not a temptation he asks of us since he's already endured something of, of that uh, greatness. But it's probably worth us remembering that it, this is all connected to Jesus' baptism. In his baptism, he receives the Holy Spirit. We hear the voice of God, the Father, speak to him and say, You're my child whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. He has that establishment, and really spoken out loud for all of us to know, he's established as God's beloved son. And it's that path. He's set on that way. And it, it, I think it's worth us pausing and asking, do we use our baptismal identity? Do we also remember that when we were baptized, whether the words were spoken out loud by the pastor or whether God spoke out loud in the sanctuary that day, do we realize that he said and feels the same way about us? You're my child, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And do we then walk in that identity and use the strength of that identity to overcome and stop the temptations that Satan is going to try to throw our way? I want to suggest to you that if that's a big part of how Jesus made it through temptation, it might work pretty well for us. If he stayed strong in that identity and we see him staying strong in that, that over and over he quotes from the scriptures, he quotes from his heavenly father and what God had written in the word, he's relying on that identity and on the promises of God and the path God has laid out before him. He's not taking any shortcuts. But there is somebody else showing up there in this temptation. We can think of him as the opposing pitcher or whatever it is you want to have as Jesus comes up to the plate. And Satan has other plans. Satan's plans do whatever he can to knock Jesus out of the batter's box. Get him to strike out. Get it so that he can't win a victory for us. And maybe it's worthwhile remembering that Satan has other plans for you and me. He comes to steal and kill and destroy, Jesus tells us in John chapter 10. He comes, as Peter describes, like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. He has other plans for us. And, and even within his name, the devil, you hear that idea. The word devil means to divide. He's trying to divide us from God, divide us from the strength that we can have in God, divide us from the eternal life we can have together with God. And so in every way possible, he had plans for Jesus and he has plans for us. And they're not good ones. Maybe that's worth remembering. God is the one that says, I have good plans for you. I know the plans I have for you. They're good. I want to prosper you. I have a great eternal future for you. And I even have blessings for you in this life. And when we give in to temptation, big and small, we're saying, hmm, that plan sounds okay. But I like this better. I want this more. I need this now. And so let's look at them. Let's take a look at these temptations that are offered, uh, by, uh, Jesus, uh, offered to Jesus and learn from them what, what we can learn, what God has in mind for us to notice about those. The, the first one that you take a look at is hearing him tempting to eat, the, make this into bread. Okay, you're hungry. I get it. Why don't you go ahead and just, you know, show me, show the world you're the Son of God. Make some bread right now. 
You certainly have the power to do that. But to give in to that temptation is to say, hmm, God had a plan and God had a path. I could take a shortcut that cuts short my suffering, means I don't have to have any more you know, physical hunger pains anymore, or I can trust that God made this path and he's good and he'll get me through this. I wonder if you know, every time our stomach rumbled, we give in to that more time, more often than not. I wonder if Jesus had just given and said, this is too hard. This is too much suffering. I, I wonder if woven into this first temptation, Satan isn't saying to Jesus, come on. You're going to save the world, but it doesn't have to be this hard, does it? You don't have to deny yourself, do you? Do you really have to suffer and go through pain? And of course, we who are on this side of the cross and this side of the empty tomb know, yes, he did have to. And so if he'll give in here, out in the wilderness, about a piece of bread, he's likely to give in in the Garden of Eden and say, oh, no, that cup is just too much for me to bear. I'm likely to give in when he gets to the cross. Oh, no, thanks. Those, those nails look a little too sharp. I don't feel like doing that. If he gives in now, Jesus won't be able to avoid giving in later. And so even though Satan has other plans for Jesus, Jesus says, no, I know what God's plan is, and I'm not going to sell it short. I'm not going to cut corners. That's what Jesus is really, or Satan's really trying to do, excuse me. He's trying to get Jesus to cut corners. You don't have to suffer like that. You don't have to do all of this. You can just be like God. We've heard that before, haven't we? Adam and Eve in the garden, back in Genesis chapter 3, you know what? You don't, you don't have to stop eating from that tree. God knows when you eat it, you'll be like him. Well, I don't know about you. I mean, I guess I want to ask you how you would feel about it. Who would you want? A real Savior who has the real strength and the real grace to give? Or would we just want someone who sort of looks like God and is kind of faking it, but in the toughest times of our lives, in the toughest challenges we would ever face, he's not going to be able to come through? That's what Satan's encouraging him to do. Let's cut some corners. Let's not really have the real strength of God, the, the real blessing that God would give. Let's instead just sort of cut corners and look like God, kind of fake our way through it. And I think that temptation hits us a lot. That we're just going to kind of fake our way through our Christianity. We're going to put on our nice Sunday morning smile and our nice Jesus-friendly mask on, on, uh, when we greet with other Christians. But when we're out there in the rest of the world, we're going to act just like the rest of the world. Because the temptation is that we just have to be like God. We don't have to really walk in his ways. We don't have to really listen to and follow in his commands. The, what Jesus prepared for us by overcoming sin and the devil on the cross and then rising in for the, to give us eternal life. It just doesn't really matter. We can just sort of fake it till we make it. And then he'll, he'll take us. Mm, no. The second temptation that Satan puts before Jesus, the one where he says, you know, all the kingdoms of this earth are mine and I can give them to, to anyone I want to give them to, is a chance for Jesus to sort of seize power without going through the plan. To sort of take the credit onto himself and really also then give credit to Satan because Satan's the one saying, ah, this is all mine, I can give it to you. That's the temptation Moses faced. In our Old Testament reading, when God says, okay, the people don't have any water, they cannot provide for themselves, I, the Lord, will provide for them, I want you to speak to that rock. The temptation hits uh, Moses. Nah, I'm going to show them I'm big stuff. I'm going to show them and I'm going to sort of yell at them and then I'm going to take my staff and smack the rock and they're going to think I'm really something special. When Moses gives in to that temptation, he loses out on the chance to lead the people of God into the promised land. He's led them out of Egypt in great triumph and glory. He's led them these 40 years in the wilderness, but he's going to lose out at the last moment of getting to go into that promised land. Now we know he didn't lose out on, on heaven. He's standing there with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. But there had to be a sadness in the soul of Moses to know what he had worked so hard to do, he was not going to fully experience. And I just ask us to file that away, that we don't want to give in to the temptation of, of Satan and, and do shortcuts and you know, 
get a kingdom that isn't ours through we, any other way than through Jesus, through what Jesus gives. We don't want to take any credit onto ourselves. We want to say, Lord, all the glory and the credit's yours. We don't want to give in to that temptation, but instead live in that baptismal identity that we are Jesus's, that we are God's and his alone. Now, when the devil gets to this last temptation, uh, the last one where he tempts Jesus about questioning his authority, oh, well, you know, why don't you throw yourself off this building? I mean, after all, and then now the devil quotes the Bible. So that's a good reminder for us that if the devil can quote the Bible, we ought to make sure we know it really, really well so we know when he tries to twist it and, and mess us up with it. But when the devil is tempting Jesus to jump off this building, he's saying, come on, force the Heavenly Father to show that he will protect you. Force him to step up because you're stepping away from the plan and now he's going to have to fill in the gap. He's questioning the devil's, uh, Jesus' authority is being questioned by the devil. Or another way to say that, Reverend uh, Starlet Thomas said that he is getting Jesus to, he's double dog daring Jesus to, uh, to show off his divinity. Come on, show me what you got. Let me, let's let's let God, God really shine through. Use it to really show off Jesus. And what's wonderful is that Jesus isn't, he never came, not to Satan's response and not for our needs. He never came to show off. He came to show up and to show us what God's love really looked like. Philippians chapter 2 says it in such a beautiful way. In all of your relationships with one another, have the same mind as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Jesus isn't going to try to show off. He's just going to show up. He's going to serve and care for us. He's going to provide for that in, the, in all the lengths of, of our lives. And he's going to trust that the plan he and the Father created was a good plan and he just needs to work it. I think sometimes we worry when things, when prayers don't seem to get answered in a timely way or when we, we or we see a loved one struggling and having a difficult time, we, we are tempted to want to just sort of grab in there and work things in our own way by our own strength, kind of like Moses was tempted to do that. Again, Reverend Starlet uh, goes on and says this, in the depths of our hearts, we tell ourselves we, we want to forget this world, but we don't want the world to forget us. Though the world is passing away, we don't want it to pass us by. We're, in essence, saying, I want my share of the stuff. I want some things for me, for my advantage. Why can't I have some comfort? Why can't, if I can have a building named after me, great. If I can have a child named after me, I guess that's good enough. You know, I want to be remembered. That's a very shallow thing, maybe a, if I can say it, a costly thing for the world to remember and to miss out that God is offering that through what Jesus does on the cross, he will remember this. Father, remember them in your kingdom. Remember them. Don't let them go. Jesus offered that to us. He knows that if we gain the whole world, we're going to lose our souls. And if Jesus gives into that same temptation, if he does that, if he, if he performs or, or, or you know, asks God to perform for him, then God is not going to be there for us. And if you and I get nothing else out of this whole Lenten journey, let's remember that the Savior never gave in to any of those temptations, never cut any of the corners, never did anything for his own authority or his own gain, did it all for us. And if, if we ever say, God, do you really love me? Do you really remember me? All we have to do is look at the cross. All we have to do is remember the Garden of Gethsemane. All we have to do is again hear him speak to us in our baptismal identity. You are my child whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Let's not ask God. God, prove to me that you're there. If you really love me, if, you're, if you really exist, and all those things, we know he does. And we know by the cross he did. And we know by the empty tomb he is still with us. So let's not ask him to perform that or to prove that. He already has. Jesus came and he gave that to us. He's not just God uh, um, you know, for himself. He's God with us. 
And in baptism, it's us then with God. It's us with God. It's us not dancing to the devil's tune. It's us knowing that when life gets tough, God's tough love is always going to be there for us. And we can trust in the God with us, or we could turn and try some of the devil's substitutes. But friends, I know you know they'll never be worth it. So let us remember that love proclaimed of us at our baptism. Let us remember that love shown overcoming all of these temptations. Let us remember that love expressed by Jesus on the cross. As he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then he said, it is finished. And he overcame the last temptation. He overcame the last price. He gave his all, not for his own advantage, but for you. Let's remember the God who loves us in that way. And let that strength help us overcome every temptation we ever face. Amen.